चैप्टर इलेवन स्कॉर्पियन ध्री सेड आई एम टेलिंग यू दिस अगेंस्ट कृष्णास विशेस वाई डजेंट ही वॉन्ट मी टू नो यूल सी सोन इनफ नाउ लिसन द स्टोरी बिगिन्स विद द ग्रेट टोर्नामेंट इन हस्तिनापुर वेर थ्रोना हैज डिसाइडेड दैट द प्रिंसेस who have come of age are ready to demonstrate their battle skills the arena thrums with anticipation the citizens noble born and commoner are anxious to see what the princes are capable of after all one of them will be their future king already there are factions some cry out duryodhan's name for he is dashing brave and generous to a fault even today riding to the tournament he threw handfuls of gold coins into the crowd until his purse was empty but others secretly pray that the highest prize will go to one of the five pandava brothers those fatherless boys brought up on the fringes of the court by an uncle who only pretends to wish them well and it seems that the gods are not deaf as we customarily accuse them of being for look here at the end of the day is arjun's name being announced as the greatest of the contenders he has shot five arrows in the air and then quenched them with rain arrows he has sent snake arrows slithering toward the crowd and then just before they struck the terrified viewers plucked them from the ground with eagle arrows his sleep arrows have enveloped them in dreams his rope arrows have bound their hands and feet his arrows of enchantment have made them cover in front of monsters more terrifying than any they could have imagined shining with pride his teacher claims that these are only the minor weapons he has learned to use the others are too powerful too sacred to be called on except in serious battle but just as his uncle the blind king gets to his feet very slowly some note with the prize garland an unknown youth in golden armor appears in the arena he asks permission to take part in the tournament and then skillfully replicates every feat of arjuns the crowd is silenced by amazement then it breaks out in cheers and duryodhan cheers the loudest the stranger brings his palms together and turns his face to the sky offering prayers to the sun he thanks the crowd with a modest bow then in courtly speech he invites arjun to single combat the winner he suggests will be the champion the crowd applauds at the prospect of this grand spectacle the three old men sitting by the king in the royal pavilion bhishma the grandfather drona the teacher and kripa the royal tutor glance at each other in dismay this is an unforeseen danger a risk they do not wish arjun to undertake for to their experience dies it is clear that the stranger is as good as or perhaps better than the pandava prince whose reputation they hope to establish today do you know this youth Bhishma asks Kripa shakes his head but Drona pauses a considering look on his face he whispers something 
Let the combat begin, says the blind king, raising his scepter, but Kripa leaps to his feet. There are procedures to be obeyed first, he says. The lineage of the contestants must be established, for a prince may be challenged to single combat only by another prince. We all know Arjun's parentage, but valiant stranger, kindly tell us your name and from which princely house you are descended. The stranger's face flushes. My name is Karna, he says. Then, so softly that all in the assembly must strain to hear, but I do not come from a princely house. Then, according to the rules of the royal tournament, you cannot battle Prince Arjun, says Kripa, his voice kind. If he feels triumphant, no one notices. He has long learned to hide such emotions. Wait, cries Duryodhan, springing up in outrage. Clearly this man is a great warrior. I will not let you insult him like this, using an outdated law as your excuse. A hero is a hero, no matter what his caste. Ability is more important than the accident of birth. The citizens approve of these sentiments. They cheer lustily. Duryodhan continues, If you insist that it is necessary for Karna to be a king in order to battle Arjun, then I'll share my own inheritance with him. He calls for holy water and pours it over the stranger's head. To the cheers of the crowd, he says, King Karna, I now pronounce you ruler of Anga and my friend. Karna embraces him fervently. I'll never forget your generosity, he says. You have salvaged my honor. Earth may break asunder, but I will not forsake you. From this moment, your friends are my friends, and your enemies my bitterest foes. The crowd roars its admiration. This, they tell each other, is how heroes should behave. The three old men exchange looks of concern. Things have not worked out the way they planned. The upstart Karna has found popularity even without vanquishing Arjun, and Duryodhan has found a powerful ally. Now the two archers, fierce in battle stance, face each other in the arena. Who knows what the outcome of this contest will be? There's a small commotion in the pavilion built for the woman of the palace. One of the queens has fainted, perhaps from heat, perhaps from the prolonged tension. Is it Gandhari, the blind king's wife? Is it Kunti, distressed at this challenge to her son? Before the truth can be ascertained, the people's attention is caught by an old man who limps into the arena. From his clothing it's clear that he belongs to a lower caste. Is he a blacksmith? No, say those who know such things. He is a chariot driver. He heads for Karna and, wonder of wonders, Karna sets aside his bow to touch the old man's feet. Son, the newcomer cries, is it really you, back after so many years? But what are you doing here, among these noble princes? Why is there a crown on your head? 
with infinite gentleness, Karna takes the old man's hand and guides him to a corner, explaining as he goes. The crowd is stunned, silent. Then whispers and jeers begin to be heard, especially among the Pandava faction. Sutaputra voices his driver's son. From the pavilion, Bhim's voice booms disdainfully. Drop your bow, pretender. Go get yourself a whip from the royal stables instead. Karna's hand tightens around his bow. Arjun, he calls, but Arjun has already turned his back on him and is walking away. Karna stares after him. It is the supreme insult, one for which he'll never forgive Arjun. From this moment on, they will be arch-enemies. Who knows what might have happened then, but the sun chooses this moment to dip beneath the horizon. A relieved Drona gives the signal and trumpeteers sound the call for the end of the tournament. The crowd disperses reluctantly, buzzing with dissatisfaction and gossip. The Pandava brothers are joined by the three old men. Together they make their way to their modest dwelling where Kunti is resting. It was she who fainted. Discussing the day's strangeness as they go, Duryodhan takes Karna with him for a night of carousing at his palace. Later that evening, he'll put his own necklace, a rope of pearls and rubies around Karna's neck and say, Thickly, I declare you the true champion. If those crowds hadn't stopped the fight, you would have rubbed Arjun's face in the mud. Ah, those Pandava vermin who are always plotting to steal my kingdom. Would that I had a friend who might rid me of them. And Karna will hold himself very straight and reply, When the time comes, I will do so for you, my liege and my friend, or I will die trying. So that's how Karna became king, I said. Why didn't Krishna want me to know? Dri said he felt that it would make you too sympathetic to Karna, and that would be dangerous. Dangerous how? Arjun isn't the only one who can pass the Swayamvar test. The pulse in my throat started hammering guiltily. I turned away facing the dark garden. You mean Karna could do it too? Yes. He plans to come to the Swayamvar along with Duryodhana. He plans to win you. We must not allow it. I wanted to ask if he were indeed as wondrous a hero as Arjun, why should it matter if I married him instead of the Pandava prince? Wouldn't he be as great an ally for Panchal? Why was Krishna so against him? Was it just that he favoured his friend Arjun? There were other secrets here, but I sensed that my uncomplicated brother did not know them. So instead I asked, How can you stop him? If he wins, aren't we honour bound by father's oath? The honour of the family is more important than other kinds of honour. My brother said. He waited a moment as though daring me to disagree. 
I'll think of a way. Krishna will help me. You too must do your part. I didn't want to argue with Dhri, but I wasn't ready to turn against Karna, not even for the sake of family honor. Instead, I asked, Adiratha said Karna has been gone for many years. Do you know where he had been? Dhri nodded grimly. The lost years of Karna's life, that's the most important part of the story and the main reason I'm telling it to you. Early in life, Karna demonstrates a passion for archery. At 16, still believing he is Adiratha's son, he goes to Drona, the foremost teacher in the land. He confesses that he is low-born and begs to be accepted as his student. But Drona is busy with princes. I will not teach a chariot driver's son, he says. Disappointed, insulted, Karna vows he will learn from one who is greater than Drona. He leaves the city for the mountains and finally, through great effort and even greater luck, though whether the luck is good or bad is uncertain, he finds the ashram of Parasuram. Drona's own teacher, I whispered, didn't he once erase the entire race of Kshatriyas from the earth because they had grown corrupt? Dhri nodded. Since the truth hasn't served him well, Krishna does not risk it again. He tells Parasuram that he is a Brahmin. Seeing his potential, the sage agrees to teach him. In time, Karna becomes the best of his students, the most beloved, the only one to whom Parasuram imparts the invocation of the Brahmastra, the weapon that no one can withstand. The day before he is to leave Parashuram's ashram, Karna accompanies his teacher on a walk through the forest. When a tired Parasuram wants to rest under a tree, Karna offers his lap as a pillow. As the old man sleeps, a mountain scorpion creeps from its hole and stings Krishna repeatedly on the thigh, drawing blood. The pain is intense, but Karna does not want to disturb his teacher. He sits unmoving, but blood spurts from his wound onto Parasuram's face and wakes him. In rage, Parasuram curses his favorite student. Shock forced me to interrupt. But why? Dhri said, Parasuram realized that a Brahmin could never have borne so much pain in silence. Only a Kshatriya was capable of that. He accused Karna of having deceived him, and, though Karna told him that he didn't belong to the warrior caste, but was merely a charioteer's son, Parasuram wouldn't forgive him. He said, just as you have deceived me, so will your mind deceive you. When you need the Brahmastra the most, you'll forget the mantra needed to call it up. What you have stolen from me will be of no use to you in the hour of your death. I was outraged. Didn't Karna's years of devoted service mean anything to Parasuram? What of his love of his teacher, because of which he bore the scorpion's sting? Wasn't that worth some forgiveness? 
Ah, forgiveness, Dhri said. It's a virtue that eludes even the great. Isn't our own existence a proof of that? A disconsolate Karna makes his way back down the mountain, having gained and then lost that which he had set his heart on. It is night. Resting in the woods outside a village, he hears a beast lumbering toward him. His mind in turmoil, he shoots an arrow at the sound. From the beast's drying cry, he realizes he has killed a cow, that most sacred of animals. I shut my eyes. I didn't wish to hear any more of this story. I willed Karna to walk away from the fallen animal before he was discovered as its killer. I knew he wouldn't. In the morning he finds the owner of the cow, confesses his deed and offers compensation. But the enraged Brahmin says, You killed my cow when she was defenseless. You too will die when you have no means of protection. Karna pleads with him to change his curse. I'm not afraid of dying, he says, but let me die like a warrior. The Brahmin refuses. How could Karna bear to keep on living after all these misfortunes? I whispered. The re shrugged. Suicide is the coward's way, and whatever his faults, Karna isn't a coward. I told you this story against Krishna's advice for two reasons. One is that the unknown is always more fascinating than the known. But in this my brother was mistaken. Nothing has more power over us than the truth. Each painful detail of Karna's story became a hook in my flesh, binding me to him, making me wish a happier life for him. But also, Dhri continued, I want you to realize that Karna is cursed. Anyone joined to him will become cursed too. I don't want that to happen to you because you are my sister, but also because you are born to change history. You don't have the luxury of behaving like an ordinary starstruck girl. The consequences of your action may destroy us all. I was annoyed at being pressed in this way, but even more, I was frightened by the conviction in his voice. All this time I hadn't known that he had taken my destiny as seriously as his own. Still. I spoke lightly. I am glad you have so much confidence in my power. But remember what Krishna said? We are nothing but pawns in time's hands. Even a pawn has a choice, my brother said. The day Sikhandi left for the forest, I longed to go with him to leave the palace behind without a backward glance, to live out my life in peace under the trees, to escape the bloody fate toward which I have been pushed every moment since I was born. I could have done it. Sikhandi would have hidden me so skillfully that the entire Panchal army wouldn't have found me. But I chose not to. Why? My throat was dry. How wrong I'd been all this time, thinking I knew my stoic, 
resigned brother. Two reasons held me back, Dhri said. One was you. I would have gladly come with you, I protested hotly, if you had only asked. The other, he interrupted, his harsh voice scraping against my ears, was myself. Through the long night, out of love for Dhri, I tried harder than ever before to bar Karna from my mind. But can a sieve block the wind? Fragments of stories floated in my head. Women who have saved their husbands by countering their ill luck with their virtue. Perhaps I could do the same for Karna. In the midst of that hope, a regret leaped up like a leopard. Why hadn't Dhri sidestepped his fate when he had the chance? I imagined him carefree under a canopy of gigantic mahogany trees, his brow erased of the creases that marred his handsomeness. But the next moment I was proud of his resolution, the way I had been of Karna for facing the angry Brahmin. I knew I shouldn't compare them, that my loyalty should be aimed only toward my brother. Yet, as I swayed between sleep and waking, the two men began to melt together in my mind. How similar their nature and their destinies were, pressing them both toward tragedy, forcing them into acts of dangerous nobility. No matter how skilled they were at battle, ultimately it would not help them because they were forever defeated by their conscience. What cruel God fashioned the net of their minds this way, so they could never escape it? And what traps had he set up for me?